G'day everybody, welcome to Pints with Aquinas. Today I am joined around the proverbial bar table by my good mate Gabe Deem to discuss pornography. And this is going to be a very fascinating episode because Gabe has suffered with sexual dysfunction in the past due to his pornography use. He has since studied how porn affects the brain, how it is addictive and these sorts of things a great deal. And you're going to be very much blessed by what he has to say today. He's been, he shared his story on MTV, uh, Netflix. He was uh, in a featured article in 2016 in Time Magazine. He's done a lot of work uh, in this area. And so it's going to be, it's going to be a help to you. Obviously, we've addressed what Thomas Aquinas has to say about lust. Um, he has four ways of overcoming lust. You can look that up at pintswithaquinas.com. Uh, soon, we'll be recording an episode in which we talk about what Thomas Aquinas says are the eight effects of lust. But I wanted to kind of have Gabe on the show just to share his story and how he began to find help because I think it's really important. And you might know and love somebody who's struggling with pornography. And you might want to share this episode with them. Gabe comes at this from a secular perspective. So him and I might not necessarily agree on everything and we may not phrase things, you know, the, the same way. So, you know, all of that is to say, if you have young people, maybe definitely don't let them listen to this, listen to it first. Um, but he has a lot of great things to say and I'm so honored to have him on the show. Hey, it is November and uh, Black Friday is this month. So we are giving away something extra to our patrons. We already give a ton of things to our patrons. Signed books, beer steins, such as that one. You have online courses, mini courses taught by university professors, um, Flannery O'Connor, Dante, Augustine. We have more uh, coming soon. You get access to tons of things. You get to ask questions. You get to be the ones who ask questions on the debates that we host. You get post-show wrap-up videos. Um, I, when I do debates, I chat with the Catholic debater after the debate, and they share how they thought the debate went, how they prepped for it, what how they thought it went. I just said that, but you, okay. So you get access to all that. We have lots of stuff. We have monthly spiritual talks by Father Gregory Pine. I had somebody recently say that nobody gives more to their patrons than Matt Fred, and I just took that. I took that uh, to heart. It was really great. It was great to hear that. Here's one extra thing we're giving just this month. Boom. Hi, this is a car magnet. It is a five inch by five inch or thereabouts car magnet of Thomas Aquinas. So if you become a patron just this month, you probably don't care about it. Here, just, well, there you go. Um, you'll get this in addition to the other things that we send you. We'll put this in your package and you can represent the big man on your car. And that's just a way to thank you for supporting us. We're really trying to grow the channel, which costs a lot of money, obviously, to do it well. And we're trying to make it better and better and better. And uh, we're just super grateful for those of you who want to support us at patreon.com slash Matt Fred. Patreon.com slash Matt Fred. Go do it right now if you want. And even if you don't want, no, even, you know, only if you want. Um, here is a course I created that I should probably tell you about. It's called strive21.com, strive21.com. If you struggle with porn or lust in any way, go to this website, strive21.com. It's a 21-day detox from porn course that I created. It is 100% free. You can be as anonymous as you want, and you can start right now, no matter where you are in the world. So what are you waiting for? If you're still not terribly convinced, go to strive21.com and click reviews up here. You can read what real men had to say about their real experience of Strive 21. It is always a good idea to choose to be healthy, to choose to live a more beautiful life. Quitting porn is a way of living a more beautiful life. Strive21.com, strive21.com. All right, here is my interview with Gabe Deem. Enjoy. Gabe Deem, how are you? I'm doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing well. We were just saying we haven't spoken in maybe over a year more. Oh, at least. Know. Yeah, probably yeah. two. It's, it's, really, it's really great to have you on the channel. Tell our listeners and viewers a bit about Gabe Deem and Reboot Nation. Well, I grew up with access, like many people today, to unlimited amounts of internet pornography. And so I could start my story... When I was eight years old, um, I was playing hide and go seek in the neighborhood like all the good lads do, and I found mm -hmm. a Playboy or Hustler magazine. 
And I had an older brother, my cousin had an older brother, and we always heard them joking about masturbation. So we knew what it was. And I began masturbating to pictures, pornographic pictures around eight years old. Um, that was my, that was and, me too. Um, yeah, That's yeah, super sad. yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy to think about. And most people don't realize how, how common that is. I know you and I do because we're in this realm and we talk about it all the time. But yeah, it's very, if that's you out there and you're a listener, you're not alone on that. Um, so at 10 years old, I started watching MTV and BET booty shaking videos and softcore porn on, um, you know, HBO and Skinamax. And uh, for the older guys, if, they're, uh, if they remember, sometimes there was like squiggly stuff if you didn't want to pay for it. And so I would stay up watching stuff like that. You know, as a 10 year old kid, late at night, my parents thought I was asleep. And, you know, as soon as they went to bed, I would turn the TV on and, you know, see what I could find. But things really got bad when I was 12. And that's when my uh, family got high speed internet. So this was mm-hmm. around 1999, uh, 2000. Uh, we got, you know, DSL when it first was fresh on the scene. And um, immediately the teenage culture at school changed. My, my, uh, my boys and I would pass pieces of paper back and forth with, you know, specific tips on how to like clear your history, delete your cookies, right. stuff like that, how to hide it from our parents. Yeah. And so that's important to point out because it was so open amongst my peer group, my friends and I. Yeah. And so, yeah. I would ride my bike home from school in middle school, you know, seventh, eighth grade as a 12 year old and watch internet porn for sometimes a couple hours before my parents got home. It's crazy that our parents didn't realize that this was happening or that, or they didn't seem to think it was that big of a deal. I remember there being magazines in the local newspaper store, obviously porn magazines, but also internet magazines that anyone could buy that I could buy as someone underage that would explain to you all the best pornographic sites. And it's crazy that our parents yeah, didn't see it, this as a huge deal. It's no fault of their own, you know. They, they had no idea, I think, how easily accessible it was. I do remember one time my mom got on the computer a couple hours after I had been, you know, doing my thing, mm-hmm. and uh, some pop-ups, you know, back in the day, there was those pop-ups that would pop up all over your computer if you clicked on some shady sites, and then, like, it's like a virus, right? Yeah. And so I remember my mom getting pop-ups everywhere, and she first looked to my dad, and he was like, I, I, I didn't do anything. And then, so they had a, that was the first, like, actual talk I had with my parents, and that was probably around the same age, maybe 13 years old. But anyways, you know, I continued watching porn all through high school, But I also um, became sexually active at the age of 14. Hmm. So, you know, around that time, I I would say that's when my battle began for my uh, libido, my drive, my natural, you know, uh, masculine energy, if you will, uh, began getting split between pixels on a screen and real people. Hmm. And so the relationships I had through high school and college, although, yes, I was um, having, you know, real sex my drive ended up being hijacked and more geared towards seeking novel content on porn sites. But, you know, I didn't know this was affecting me at the time. I didn't realize it was a problem until I was 23 years old when I went to have sex with a beautiful girl. And when we tried to, my body couldn't respond. Mm. No matter, you know, I thought she was just gorgeous, just beautiful. And I knew that wasn't an issue. I knew it wasn't an attraction thing. I knew, you know, I was otherwise physically healthy. I was in pretty good shape. I've always been into fitness and sports and stuff. So I didn't have any known physical causes. And I had, like I said, I'd had sexual experience. So when we went to have sex and my body couldn't respond, I couldn't get an erection no matter what we tried to do. Mm -hmm. That was when I had my breaking point. I remember crying my to sleep that night and staring at the ceiling wondering what the crap is wrong with me like what did I like what is wrong with me I had no clue Mm. and so I did what anyone would do I went down the Google rabbit hole and I found forums with thousands and thousands of guys with the same story that they had used internet porn for several years and screwed themselves up to where they were now dependent on pixels on a screen to function And they couldn't feel anything in a real intimate situation, even with partners they considered, you know, beautiful, gorgeous, attractive. They were in love with that. That is that is that's wild. And so what did that do to your view of pornography? Obviously, you had a positive view to it at the time. And when you learned this about what pornography was doing to you, what was your response? 
So when I found that forum, that was my big epiphany. I saw a post to see if you could, um, if you were able to masturbate without porn. Cause at the time I didn't believe it. When I first saw that porn was causing these guys problems, I was like, there's no way, you know, I was skeptical. Mm -hmm. There's no way porn's causing problems. You know, like I said, I had been using it for years. I was having real sex. I was functioning fine. But then eventually I hit rock bottom. But once I realized I did the porn induced ED test, yeah. which I don't, you don't recommend, but see if you can masturbate without porn. And that's important because it rules out performance anxiety. Right. So, right. you know, when I first was looking for answers, all I could find was, Hey, are you nervous? You're probably just nervous about sex. And I was like, no, I don't think I am, but I'll try this test. But I realized I couldn't even masturbate without porn using my fantasy, using mm -hmm. my, you know, my own, what I had at will in my hand. Got you, got you. Yeah. That, yeah, so that makes sense. So it's like, if it were just a matter of anxiety, surely you should be able to yeah. achieve and maintain an erection on your own through, yeah, without Yeah, I always, I always say no one's nervous about pleasing their own hand. So you don't have performance anxiety with yourself. So it rules out physiological causes because you can function with a screen and simply opening up your laptop or turning on your phone wouldn't magically make cardiovascular disease disappear. <laughs> and if you can fun or if you can't function with just by yourself and no pressure, then it's not performance anxiety. So it's clear that you're dependent on a mm -hmm. stimulus. So mm -hmm. what it did to my, you know, to answer your question, I I I completely view it as anti-sex. It 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 actually robbed me of the one thing that I thought it would give me, the, the ability to experience sexual pleasure. You know, I was always in a hedonistic pleasure pursuit, and it actually did the opposite of that. I experienced, you know, I got to a point where I couldn't even have sex, and I don't think there's anything more sex negative than that. So the, my view com Yeah, yeah at, at the time, is that what you were, because I understand you've come to hold that view now. At the time, yeah. though, when you felt pretty positive about pornography, is that what you were thinking then? No, that that only that my thought process switched when I realized right. that it had screwed me up. Yeah. And and then, you know, so I had my light bulb moment. I was broken. I was in a relationship. And so I was reading these guys stories that there was hope, you know, and this is the good thing that the brain can always change. Mm -hmm. And so I was reading all about the neuroscience and reading the studies and reading what mainstream media was saying. And. I had so much hope, you know, Norman Doidge's book, The Brain That Changes Itself, that I know you're familiar with. He has an entire chapter in there about how the brain can always change and rewire and how he's treated clients with porn induced sexual dysfunctions and had them recover. And so filled with hope, I decided to reboot to um, we, we call it that because you can envision your brain kind of defaulting back to default settings, reverting back to how it was before you downloaded porn on your brain. Um, and so I did it, man. I, I, I quit porn. I uh, went through a brutal recovery. Tell us about that. What was that like? Yeah. So, so f with behavioral addictions, um, oftentimes there are withdrawal symptoms of stress and anxiety. And uh, that's what happened in my case. I had extreme anxiety, stress, uh, trouble sleeping. There was a couple panic attacks I had. And I'm normally a laid back, chill dude, not typically don't struggle with that. But that process was just terrible. And then I also went into what's called a flat line, where you feel a complete loss of libido. And, you know, as a 20 year old man, if you feel like you're 100 with no drive at all, that can be very, very scary. And that's one of actually the most common questions I get is about the flat line. So these, uh, con these sort of uh, effects that you're experiencing through detox, is this something that you've been able to see happen in other people as well? This is, this is a oh, common absolutely. experience for men? Yeah, yeah. The flat line is very common. If you have reached a level of dependency on porn, it's like your brain has to reset the, uh, you know, the pleasure thermostat back to real life. And you have to you know, go a period of time where you regain sensitivity and we can get into the science. So you have to regain sensitivity and then you have to rewire your arousal template. And there's a pretty, you know, for especially young guys who grew up when our brains were more, you know, vulnerable mm -hmm. to sensitization, to conditioning, to learning. We deeply wire our brain for porn way more than, you know, if you started watching porn when you're 50 or 60. So the adolescent brain is a big component of that. And we see worse 
you know, wow. sometimes worse recovery periods for a lot of the younger guys who grew up, you know, cutting their teeth on internet porn. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I can imagine someone saying, okay, pornography has always existed in one form or another. You know, my granddad probably saw it or may have used it. My dad may have used it. People weren't talking about porn-induced erectile dysfunction. So, But you're right, there's a massive difference between finding a magazine and looking at it every now and again and having multiple yeah. screens open and masturbating all night long to it. You bring up a good point. So there was, there was a big shift in 2006, and that's when YouTube was created. Mm -hmm. So that's when you had the explosion of porn tube sites. And so, you know, back in the day, our grandfathers would use a magazine or go to the store to buy a tape. Now, once smartphones and tube sites were created, everyone has unlimited access in their pocket 24 seven. And the big thing that that leads to is novelty. And from what we've seen, the research I've seen, you know, not, there's studies that show that novelty is one of the biggest driving factors for developing a pornography addiction. That constant click, that constant search that gets us addicted to social media, the swipe, always looking for that next dopamine hit. Mm -hmm. Novelty exploded whenever porn tube sites hit the scene. And that correlates with my story too. You know, back in 2006, a couple years after I started watching tube sites is when I couldn't function anymore without porn. And so 2008 was when you really started to see an explosion of forums all over the internet with guys complaining about porn induced sexual dysfunctions, whether it's low libido where they don't feel that sex drive anymore, whether it's morphing sexual taste and they're watching mm -hmm. stuff that used to disgust them or just addiction. And so novelty is a really big game changer that sets porn of the past from present today's hyper stimulating internet porn. Yeah. Tell us how like your I see what you mean. You said that you began to see pornography as sex negative. Like I presume and you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, that if somebody came to you and said, OK, fine, I don't want to overdo it with pornography because that can lead to things like erectile dysfunction, etc. But so I'm just going to look at it like once a month or like once every two months. And you know what? I've actually been doing that. And with, with success, I'm not actually spiraling. I mean, I presume or at least I would hope that you would still see that as a negative thing. I mean, do I think it's possible you could occasionally view it without it developing into an addiction or a problem? Sure, if we yeah, wanted, yeah. If you, I, if we wanted to argue that point. Um, but I don't think that you ever need to do that. It's this, I view it the same way I would view cigarettes or drugs. It's something that's unnecessary. It's something that will impact you and you know a lot, one of the arguments that's pro porn is you know use pornography to explore your fantasies well you're not exploring your fantasies if you're watching what someone else created you're downloading that into your own arousal template so if you wanted to explore yourself you would do the opposite of watch what other people have done other people's and, fantasies yeah exactly and so no i don't i don't think it's beneficial in any way i don't think um you know humans got along just fine for thousands and thousands and thousands of years without it. And so I think that argument falls flat as far as occasional use not developing into a problem because, you know, there's plenty of guys on recovery forums that said they only used it occasionally and still developed the problem. So that's always a risk too. Wow. Wow. Um, okay. Where do you want to go from here? I'd love to kind of talk about some of the objections that we hear uh, if you want to go there now. Yeah. I'd also love you to tell us a bit about Reboot Nation since that's something you founded and I'd love to mm -hmm. hear of how, how that's helping folks too. Yeah, well, so Reboot Nation is a recovery community. Anyone can sign up with a pseudonym and get help and encouragement along the reboot process, the recovery process. And it's partnered with my uh, YouTube channel. That's where I put out all my content, create helpful motivational and advice videos. You know what's, and, what's great about you, Gabe, I just have to say sort of off the cuff is you come off like um, su like you are super relatable, um, you know, almost like a, hey, what's up? But And then when people start watching your YouTube clips, like, holy crap, this guy's like super intelligent. It's, it's very kind of <laughs> deceptive. I think people are like, this is just a bruh. And then they start listening to your stuff and they're like, whoa, it's, it's hey, a really I, cool gift you have. I thank you, but I just read what smart people say and then regurgitate it. So <laughs> the, the good, the good, uh, the good borrow the great steal. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of arguments and misconceptions and myths that we could get into. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, 
I mean, the first the first one I, I'd like to talk about is just this this, and here's what the here's what the objector would say: pornography is not addictive. When when you call pornography addic- addictive, really all the all you're doing is trivializing real addictions, mm-hmm. right? Like like substance uh, abuse, yeah. and and you're also sort of giving people an out people then play the victim and say well look i i am ad- i'm addicted i'm an addict like i'm different than you and they throw themselves a pity party or they use that label to justify continued behavior what mm-hmm. do you say to that objection well there's a few things there i think the first thing is addiction isn't just to substances and it's not just about having a toxic effect on the body for instance gambling addiction has been a ex- uh, respected actual addiction now for a decade and it's in the DSM in the behavioral addiction category so my argument would be if you can be addicted to pulling a lever or playing with cards why could you not be addicted to pornography something that releases more dopamine and more neurochemicals in the brain so if you can be addicted to gambling you can be addicted to porn and there's yeah. there's now and I know you're aware of uh, the studies, but there's now 54 neurological studies that support the porn addiction model. And all of those studies has found measurable physiological brain changes that mirror substance addiction. So if you want to look at the, um, my, my argument back to that, that argument that porn addiction is not real would be looking at the brain disease model of addiction, right? So um, Nora Valco put out a great review in 2016 um, about the brain disease model of addiction. And they walked through four main brain changes. Sensitization, which is like a super memory of pleasure for reward. Think Pavlov's dog that salivates when he hears a bell. And then desensitization, which is a numbed reward circuit where every normal Every uh, everyday normal pleasures become less stimulating, and then you really want to crave your reward. And then hypofrontality, which is a weaker executive function, and yeah, in the frontal lobe. So your decision making part of the brain gets impaired. So you don't foresee negative consequences in the future, or you know what you're doing at that moment once you're aroused. You're not thinking clearly. And then altered stress response. Where when you become stressed and, you know, norepinephrine and cortisol is increased in your body, that triggers those sensitized pathways. And then you turn to that one thing that you think is going to give you relief but actually cause the problem in the first place. And so there's 54 neurological studies that show altered prefrontal function you know, hypofrontality, weak in executive control. And there's tons of studies, you know, from Cambridge University, Max Planck Institute that show reduced gray matter, which is reduced nerve signaling, dopamine uh, signaling, um, and uh, hyper reactivity when exposed to addiction related cues. There's over 20 studies that support sensitization. And all of this neurological evidence is in line with substance addiction that Real addiction experts at um, places like the American Society of Addiction Medicine have acknowledged and known about for a decade. So really what you see in the mainstream debate is a group of people that are up to date with the latest science and a group of people that are either ignorant of the science or partnered with the porn industry and they have an agenda to push. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose that does lead to a more foundational question, which is, what do we mean by addiction? Because if we debate that pornography is addictive, we have to know what we mean by addiction. And I think sometimes when people say addiction, they just mean a thing that I don't want to do that I keep doing or something. But as you say, if we if we look at it from a neurological perspective, that kind of gives us something concrete to debate about. Yeah, you can see, like I said, you can actually see addiction in the brain. You know, if you take a non-addict and an addict and you expose them to, let's take cocaine, for example, cocaine addicts will light up like a Christmas tree when they see white lines that remind them of their addiction. In the same way, a porn addict's brain lights up like a Christmas tree whenever they see something related to sexual activity. And so you can see that. You can also see that reduced signaling from the prefrontal cortex to the, you know, the steering wheel of the brain to the engine, you can see that disconnect. You can actually observe it in the brain. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that's like the strongest argument. And that if you really want to talk about what addiction is, I always just say it's the continued use despite negative consequences. That's the simplest way to define it. And yeah. So, so what would your response be to people online such as Nicole Prouse and others who are 
have PhDs and have studied this issue and say, actually, pornography is not addictive. Um, if you were to go online right now and type pornography is not addictive, whether you went to, I don't know, Psychology Today or Cosmo or yeah. uh, wherever else, they always seem to be uh, citing one or two uh, studies put out by Nicole Prouse. Yeah. Um, what would you say to that? Well, so Nicole Prouse's two studies, uh, EEG studies, there have been, I think, about 10 reviews that have critiqued her studies from other neuroscientists, behavioral addiction experts. And they actually say her findings are in line with pornography addiction and that she didn't read it right. Um, so for instance, uh, her 2015 study found that um, the, the heavy pornography users had a habituated response when they were exposed to images of vanilla pornography. Mm -hmm. So basically, they used a lot of porn and regular old fashioned stuff didn't do it for them anymore. And this was actually in line with Simone Kuhn's study out of Germany in the Max yeah. Planck Institute, right? That's the study that found, you know, um, reduced gray matter in the striatum. And again, it also found altered uh, connectivity from the thinking part of the brain to the, to the motivational part. And so, yeah, I mean, I just think that you have to look at the vast preponderance of evidence when you're looking at the debate and over 50 studies have said that their findings are in line with the addiction model and then you have one lone researcher who's right. saying otherwise. It's also probably important to point out that an fMRI study is much more sophisticated than an EEG study. Right, exactly. So my understanding is EEGs like brain waves, and right. you can't really tell exactly what's going on. And fMRIs, you can actually see the specific parts of the brain that are, you know, being engorged with blood and showing activity and showing neurochemical interaction. So yeah, you're you're absolutely right on that. How, how does this change how we help people with pornography addiction? Like, I mean, from your understanding, how were people trying to help people with porn addiction, say, 20, 30 years ago? And then how does how do these studies kind of influence how we should probably help them today? So I'm passionate about getting the basic neuroscience taught to everybody, right? Um, not just for porn. I mean, think about it. I, I just watched the uh, Social Dilemma on Netflix the other day okay. about how everyone's just addicted to social media and to uh, our phones. I feel like I have been saying this for 100 years. <laughs> Everywhere I go, I've been telling people to break their phones, and now it's cool all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, I'm, do I'm actually doing a you know, fast from social media right now, yeah, abstaining from man. social media, because I need it. I need to... I've it's been the a, worst. You know, it's the worst. Phones just, suck. I hate just them. During quarantine, I've been addicted to the internet, just swipe and swipe and click, click. So yeah, I want I want the neuroscience to be taught to everyone so they can make informed choices. You know, we have kids addicted to video games where they're they're designed to be as addictive as possible, where the bus comes in at a different angle every game. When you drop and land somewhere, there's a different gun every time. It's always a surprise. It's novelty, novelty, novelty. novelty. They know exactly what to do to keep kids engaged in games. And the same way with social media. You know, you always get that notification bell. You get all those little dopamine hits. And so I think as far as helping people recover and helping people with the science. Number one, my advice for recovery is to get educated. Learn the basic science so you know what to do and what to avoid. Number two, get plugged in to a support community. You know, I know I know you have, um, uh, is it Strive? Yeah, strive21.com. Yeah. We got about 28,000 men going through it right now, that's, I think. That's incredible. That ridiculous. So, it's awesome. And so, I mean, two things there. Number one, if you're struggling, you're not alone. But number two, get plugged in somewhere and start sharing your story and giving advice because I always say helping others helps ourselves. That's one of the biggest benefits that I had speaking up is that it's kept it me. Also, it also helps you not feel so lonely. I mean, you experienced yeah. that. I mean, you felt terrified. You said you were crying. You didn't couldn't sleep. And then you went online and you found people who resonated with your experience. And I think one of the reasons we go back to that thing that promises to satiate us sometimes mm -hmm. is when we feel lonely and desperate and the world seems futile. But when you can yep. find people who can resonate with your experience and encourage you, that's incredibly helpful. Absolutely. I, uh, I decided to speak up for two reasons, primarily. Um, one was I, I knew that the information that was available was getting ignored. And uh, people like Gary Wilson, who runs your brain on porn .com, were getting smeared and attacked and ad hominem attacks thrown at him. And they weren't addressing the substance of his argument. And then the other part was young people were suicidal. You know, young people were 
hurting and desperate for information. And it wasn't getting passed around. It wasn't getting, you know, out there. And so um, there were some people doing it like, you know, like Gary Wilson and um, organizations like Fight the New Drug. They were starting to push it out, too. And I there wasn't that, you know, there wasn't the face to the problem. Like, hey, look, I'm a I'm a young dude. I got screwed up and there's hope. You know, I recovered, uh, learned the science, learned the information, what you need to do. And there's hope. The brain can always change. And so that would be my second piece of advice is to to reach out, get plugged okay. in somewhere, get support. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so like kind of study and then get support. This is so crucial. It's amazing. Like in that Strive 21 course, it's 21 days that help mm-hmm. people break free from porn for those who aren't familiar. But I think like the second or the third day, I explained the, ne- the necessity of an accountability partner or call it what you want. Yeah. And um, I tell people to kind of let us know you know, not not to go f- forward in the course until they've found somebody and to sh- yeah. share about it in the group. It's amazing how many men so important. do not have somebody they can share their yeah this that this part of their life with. And I I I think uh, I think the third piece of advice would be replacement activities. You know, okay. when you when you cut something out that's been a big part of your life, uh, you need to fill that void with something healthy. And the same, you know, the other side of that coin is you might have withdrawal symptoms. So do replacement activities that can help you combat withdrawal symptoms. Mm -hmm. So things like stress and anxiety, you know, the brain chemicals, cortisol, norepinephrine, like I said earlier, that will trigger you to go back to use. You need to do something soothing, something that will, um, you know, redirect your motivation. So things like intense exercise, um, meditation, prayer, uh, socializing, you know, learn mm-hmm. something new, dancing, take up an instrument, new language, stuff like that. Something healthy, something that's active that will give you a good dose of neurochemicals and, you know, kind of suppress that withdrawal symptom. Is there a danger for some people in your experience, you know, they try to replace the activity, but they end up just doing something not as harmful, but something that's not optimal, like video games, for example? Oops. I think... I think video games can be a, a decent replacement, but again, it's, I know myself personally, I, I consider myself addicted to video games too back in the day. I played tons of Call of Duty and <laughs> Pokemon Go when it came out. Uh, but yeah, so video games are tough for me. I try to avoid that as a replacement activity. But if you can control your use and you don't have a problem with that, then sure. that's perfectly fine. But I think, I think physical things and actual real social interaction are the best. I know right now with COVID, that's not always possible, but definitely intense exercise, intense anaerobic exercise, lifting weights, running sprints, stuff like that is is really... It's amazing that all of our advice, whether that be for people who are spending too much time watching or any time watching pornography or people who are eating unhealthy or people who are sitting around doing nothing, that the answer almost always boils down to like live a human life. Like yeah. move, move your body. Like don't eat these kinds of foods. Like eat like back to basics. Yeah, like, get back to and, the basics. Like it's crazy that one of your pieces of advice, and I agree with you, is like socialize. In other words, like yeah. speak to human beings about things that are important to you. You know, like trust human beings, be vulnerable with some human beings. Yeah. Yeah, I think avoiding super normal stimulation, right? So, um, there were studies that show a researcher, Nicholas Tinbergen, who coined the term supernormal stimuli, he actually could trick birds and beetles and yeah. other animals to pursuing fake over real because yeah. they perceived it as more stimulating. And so if you look at what we're dealing with right now in our world, there's supernormal stimulation in every category. You got junk food. You got ice cream, pizza, burgers that are way more calories than anything we've ever had in the past. And it's a super normal version of something we naturally need, like healthy vegetables, healthy food. And so you have social media. We're designed to connect. We're designed to have conversations and be social and laugh and enjoy the the moment together. But instead, we get addicted to the dopamine hit of novelty on a screen. We, our social drive gets hijacked. And then you have video games. Video games hijack our natural drive to level up in life. And instead you get stuck leveling up on a Uh. computer, trying to get a new Fortnite skin or whatever the case may be. 
And then you have pornography hijacking our natural sex drive, our natural drive to connect with other people. So That's junk incredible. food, video games, social media, and porn, literally all super normal stimulation, stuff we're naturally designed to want, to desire, that are all good and beautiful, but they are more stimulating and can rewire our brains to where we deny the real thing. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not uh, promoting um, South Park, but that reminded me of that line from Cartman. You know, the World of Warcraft episode, where it's like, "When life gets hard, you don't just give up on the world of Warcraft." <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't seen that episode, but yeah, yeah no, no need to look That's... it up. I'm sure we have better things to do. But all right, a couple other things I want to ask you about. What's the difference, or is there a difference between sex addiction and porn addiction? Oh, definitely. So. I guess the foundation needs to be said that all addiction is about altered function in the brain. So there's similarities, right? Um, all addiction is a primary disease of uh, a pursuit of reward related to memory and learning. So regardless of what you're addicted to. But there does need to be a differentiation between porn addiction and sex addiction. Um, for Just first of all, because it can be confusing. If you're a, if you're a, a virgin porn addict, and you go to a 12-step recovery sex addict group, and they're all talking about you know, all the stuff they used to do in the back alley with strangers, you're not gonna relate to that. So that's, that's one thing. And then the other thing is porn addiction can lead you to a place where you have a sexual dysfunction, like erectile dysfunction, you can't even have sex. So I like to say, how can you be addicted to something you've never done or something you can't even do? And I mm. think it's as simple as you so can't. I've sometimes heard the objection, well, if you're saying I can get erectile dysfunction by porn, why aren't married people, say, who have lots of sex uh, getting erectile dysfunction? What do you say to that? Well, there's two things. You know, you'd have to look at age of first. <laughs> I mean, I, I could answer that really <laughs> simply. It's like, uh, well, it's because I'm not having sex for five hours a night with a million different women. Like, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's a difference there. Yeah. And then, yeah, age of first exposure, you know, you're not chronically using porn, like you said, for hours on year, years on end. And then I can also show you tons of married guys that have erectile dysfunction that were having real sex, but porn ended up winning that battle. Um, yeah. And I think also, you know, porn isn't sex. You know, one argument against raising awareness about porn's negative effects is they'll say, oh, well, porn's no big deal because, you know, sex is natural and healthy. And I'm like, wait a minute. Uh, that's like saying cigarettes can never cause a problem because our bodies are designed to inhale things. You know, we're not <laughs> we're it. not designed to mate with our cell phones. And that's, you know, should be common sense. But if they're going to argue that porn can never cause negative effects because sex is natural and healthy, then you have to realize that porn is not real sex. And that's how you see it play out in an addict's life differently, where Many porn addicts don't have high libidos and high drives for actual sex. They have a high drive for novelty on a screen. And that's the biggest differentiator between the two. Hmm. Yeah, I think I've heard you say, maybe somebody else said, you know, if you get addicted to playing, say, an NFL football game on your PlayStation, yeah. it, it doesn't make you an athlete. It doesn't make yeah, you addicted to playing football. <laughs> exactly. That's the analogy I like to use. You know, would you, would you call a video game addict who's a beast at Madden NFL <laughs> – you know, top of the leaderboards, but you put, if he's never played football and goes out on the field, he won't even be able to throw a ball, much less catch one. And so you wouldn't call him a football addict. You would call him a video game addict. And that's okay. okay. So if somebody wanted to seek therapy, then, um, what would they look for? Like a sex addiction therapist, a porn addiction therapist? Like how do they, is there someone specific they should be looking to get? Yeah. So most C, uh, CSAT certified sexual addiction therapists will be educated on both types. You know, they, they pretty much are knowledgeable about all forms of sexual addiction. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, the, the umbrella term in my opinion would be sexual addiction. And so, yeah, you could, any therapist that is educated, especially from the Carnes, uh, Stephanie Carnes and Patrick Carnes, they do a great job and they, yeah. they have the CSAT certification. So anyone with the CSAT would be knowledgeable to help somebody out with that. Another question is, what do you have to say to people who may have experienced some degree of freedom and felt very optimistic? Uh, maybe they went five months or two weeks, and then they had a setback. Or maybe they've gone a few years and had a setback. And then they had a couple of setbacks after that, and they got up, and, 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 and uh, yeah, well, they feel very hopeless. What do you say? 
keep going one step at a time. You know, you've, if, if you go a couple weeks without pouring, that's 14, that's 14 steps forward and one step back. If you have a slip up and your brain's gotten stronger for it, you've avoided that stimulus for weeks or days, or it doesn't even matter if you go a couple days without it, that's progress. As long as you're getting 1% better each attempt, you're going to eventually recover. And so, yeah, I would just really simple advice. Just keep pushing, keep trucking. We've seen guys struggle for years and eventually find freedom and it's beautiful and it can be done. So yeah, if you, it's funny because you think, what's the alternative? It's like, okay, well you, you've messed up. So just keep messing up. So yeah. like, no, it's yeah, so you you have have, two options at this you point. You don't have yeah. any choice, but to keep pushing forward. And um, I mean, you know, this too, like, you know, that porn never satisfies you you know that porn's never going to give you what you want i always say you know there's no amount of porn that will ever love you back so if you're turning and pursuing pleasure on a screen with your pants around your ankles in a dark room that's never going to give you joy that's never going to give you lasting fulfillment there's no one at the no end one, of their life <laughs> no no one wants a statue made of them in that position no and no, no one's, one's proud gonna, of that no one's going to get to the end of their life and wish that they watched more porn. They're going to they're going to wish they did the things like we were talking about earlier, socializing, forming real human connections, uh, making love to your spouse, stuff mm-hmm. like that. Like that's what people are going to look back and wish they did more of. And that's another thought. Like if you have a relapse, that's OK. Learn from it. Write down some advice I would have just practical is just write down what triggered you write down the events in the day that led to you seeking out pornography and what was it so you can avoid it in the future and maybe change your environment. You know, there's a there's a study, like I said, that um, cocaine addicts, alcohol addicts, gambling addicts, their brains will light up the same neurological pathways when they see something related to their addiction. So a good piece of advice for someone that's struggling is switch things up in your house. You know, maybe move your bed or keep your phone out of the room or um, only get on the internet at a coffee shop or in public or stuff like that. You have to change something. Drastic times call for drastic measures. And if you are, you know, repeatedly struggling, switch it up just don't overthink things real simple switch it up what's your opinion of sexaholics anonymous i think it has a lot of good in it um i i've never fully bought into the idea of once an addict always an addict yeah but i mean it feels so defeating about it? All the, well yeah it's 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 literally saying you're going to be addicted for the rest of your life but as i said earlier if you define addiction as continued use despite negative consequences then mm-hmm. if you're no longer using, why would you still do, definition, why, you're not yeah, why would you still call yourself an addict? But mm-hmm. other than that, I, I, I agree with all the steps, the focus on, um, you know, uh, accountability, the focus on making amends to people you may have hurt in the past. Yeah. And just the, the fellowship of it is absolutely beautiful. There's something beautiful about sharing what you're most ashamed of to people who then don't leave. I think one of the deepest fears is they will leave. Like people, if I, if people knew this about me, they would lose all respect for me and they wouldn't hang around. And SA yeah, disproves that in a very kind of concrete way. I've had the complete opposite experience. and I'm sure you're the same way. It's like yeah. whenever we're vulnerable about our just horrible mistakes we've made and regrets that we have, people relate and they see you as, as human. You know, when I, when I first started saying, hey, guys, uh, I watched a lot of porn and it screwed me up to where I couldn't get my penis to function without it, you know, I thought people would be like, whoa, but actually they were like, <laughs> my friends were actually like, oh, that explains a lot. Yeah. You know, it's like a majority of my friends who I would have never have known had a problem also mm. had a porn addiction or they had morphing sexual taste where they were watching stuff they didn't want to watch. You know, they escalated into that um, or they uh, had delayed ejaculation where they found it difficult to climax with the real partner. A majority of my guy group were screwed up and they didn't even know it. Mm-hmm. And um, they didn't know porn was the cause. And so sharing my story, you know, now I've pretty much told everyone that knows me. And the, <laughs> even those the, who don't, Starbucks lady, the, whoever, I just start telling them immediately. But well, even, uh, before I, I, <laughs> even before I introduced myself. I put, so if I'm reading a book on porn, I'll just set it on the table when I walk in at a coffee shop. And it has started so many <laughs> conversations. It's amazing. Uh, but yeah, beautiful. there's no, there's no shame in being, and being open, I always, you know, that is one thing that I, sh- I should say is so many 
guys that struggle with this are so scared to speak up or share publicly or like you said, even just go to a support group. They're so afraid that they're going to be seen as gross. But the reality is, number one, so many more people than you could ever imagine are struggling with this. Right. You know, there's there's been studies that show rates of almost 30 percent of guys think they're addicted to porn. And so and, and even higher in some surveys. And so um, so many people are struggling with it. And if you are being vulnerable and on a path to improve yourself, mm-hmm. people respect that. Yeah, there's Regardless. nothing to be ashamed about saying I need to take concrete steps, to become a better person. Like that's yeah. actually a really courageous thing. Nobody thinks that's a bad a bad thing to to share. And yeah. so, yeah, have hope and you're not alone and, and speak out. And my last piece of advice, if you want me to get into it, yeah. is change how you view porn. Um, I don't mean start watching it standing up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, view it. And this, this will uh, apply, I think, really well to a lot of your listeners, too. Of course, you can have your moral opinion about pornography. But if you view pornography as primarily unhealthy, you know, why are why are things considered sins from a religious perspective? If you look at it, most of them are to keep you from ruining your life. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're trying to pursue the fullness of pleasure and joy, uh, what is the John 10, 10, the, the fullness of joy rather than to steal, kill and destroy. Like, look, apply that to just everything. Apply that to eating. Apply that to how you should engage in sex. Apply that to mm-hmm. uh you know, whatever the case may be, drugs, anything. It's like, if you really want to get the most pleasure out of a situation, then you need to know what's best for you. And like I said, pornography is not it. Pornography will lead you to a place where you can't feel any pleasure. And so I view pornography the same way I view cigarettes, the same way I view junk food. It's it's something that, yeah, might be super stimulating for a short period of time, but it can really screw me up. And I think if people have that, uh, mindset about pornography it can really help you abstain regardless uh, of yeah and then if, i don't know if this is too personal or not given how much you share of your story it probably isn't but you got married recently what was that experience like yeah so uh, i got married a little over a year ago congrats thank you thank you it was it was awesome you know i we've uh, we've been together for forever so okay. it's good to finally uh good to finally get married and so um yeah it's been good we picked a uh, we picked quite the year to uh <laughs> we picked quite the year to get married got quarantined together so we've had a uh, we've had plenty of time to enjoy the honeymoon phase locked in our locked in our house that's cool one of the things you said about uh, seeing porn differently it, it made me think of this i remember when my wife gave birth to our first son liam and i remember standing in the hospital room as she was learning how to breastfeed him and mm-hmm. as i looked upon the beauty of motherhood uh, I saw it in a sense as a thorough rebuke of pornography. It's almost like the beauty of motherhood shamed, kicked mm. the shit out of um, mm. pornography. It just you see the counterfeit uh, next to the real powerful thing, yeah. and you're like, oh god, that pales in comparison. <laughs> you know? Well, what's a? What, I've heard you use a quote before. Um, I forget who says it, but the problem with pornography is not that it shows too much, is that it shows too little of a person. Yeah, that's oft, it's, often, um, it's often said that John Paul II said that, but we have no evidence that he did, but it certainly sums up his thought. Right? Yeah. Because it actually, yeah, it, it sort of suppresses and obfuscates the person. It's yeah. like the, the, interior, the interiority, the, the interior life of the person is suffocated and she becomes a shell for my selfish gratification. Yeah. It's kind of like, it's funny, like when you think of um, Fifty Shades of stupid that book series at first it appears like okay so he's the predator and and of course he is in a sense um and she's this poor little victim but really it was sort of like sexualized Mm self-idolatry you know she was being worshipped in a sense and i feel like pornography we often go with this desire to be seen wanted you know men will talk about when i look at pornography i feel alive i feel pursued i feel strong and masculine so there there is something we're trying there there is a need or a constellation of needs that we have that we're trying to have met um and they just as you say don't work yeah and it, it in a real simple sense it just reduces people to objects and people are so much more than that and when you chronically use people as objects you become an objectifier, and that's the only way you can function in the world. And of course, 
that leads to tons of relational conflict. And pornography has collateral damage. Uh, one thing, you know, one thing I should say is there's so many partners out there that think they're the problem. Mm -hmm. But if, if, if you're with someone that has a pornography addiction, the problem is in their brain, not with your body. And there's, there's so many partners that need to really understand that. Um, and you know, obviously you can't say a blanket statement for every situation, but a porn addict is seeking that dopamine hit. They're seeking novelty. They're seeking something maybe even shocking and surprising to give them that bigger neurochemical hit. So even what they're watching might not even be what they truly want to watch. And I know that's true in my case. I escalated into to genres mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I'll, I don't have to get specific, but I was watching stuff that was just shocking to me. Yeah. And several years earlier, I wouldn't have been interested in that. And it's, you know, it's confusing and hard to explain. But after you have that, you know, after you're done uh, jerking off to porn, most heavy porn users know what that epiphany is like of what the crap did I just watch? Yeah, yeah. And it's and that's why I think the science is so cool, man, is because it makes sense that you're escalating into something Number one, shocking, surprising, or anxiety-producing content will actually raise dopamine and sexual arousal in the brain. And so once you've, been, once you've become desensitized and you're now seeking that shocking content, it's because you need that bigger neurochemical hit to achieve the same feelings of pleasure. And that also will help you feel like you're not a gross, just mm -hmm. hopelessly perverted person. It's you have a genuine problem in your brain That's and so it, and it can be, and it can be reversed because the shame some people have of the content and the genres that they're watching can just be so paralyzing. But if you can look at it again, from that health perspective, the way your brain is designed, you've misused the natural design of your brain and you've become numbed, you've become rewired and jacked up. And it's, it's not necessarily defining you as a person it's defining the condition of your brain yeah that's really important because i can imagine some people spiraling into these different fetishes and, and and weird sorts of things and thinking okay this is who i really am like this yeah. is the kind of person i am and you talked about earlier that the sexual template isn't this sort of stable unalterable thing no so sexual conditioning is a huge part of it and i think that's actually probably the most important concept to understand is sexual conditioning. So I'm glad you I'm glad you led me right into that. There's been studies where researchers condition rats to be turned on by the smell of rotting flesh. The smell is called cadaverine and they can mate males and females together with the female sprayed with the scent of decaying flesh. And after they mate them together, the rats will then be conditioned to that smell and actually show signs of arousal. They will play with toys that are sprayed with cadaverine. And the normal unconditioned rats that never had that sexual experience with that smell tied into it, they never conditioned that. They will actually like bury toys that are sprayed with, uh, sprayed with that smell and stay mm. far away. So when you think about that, if, if animals can be conditioned to become aroused – by something that is normally repulsive, then what is pornography doing to us? We're downloading shocking, abusive, often you know misogynistic content into our arousal template. We're training our brains like Pavlov's dog to the bell to respond to stuff that we find repulsive. Mm -hmm. And that's why you get so confused when you become a heavy porn user and you escalate into that stuff is because like why – why am I into this? Why do I like it? It's, it's that rewiring of the arousal template in the brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, gosh, that's really helpful. Thanks a lot, Gabe. Hey, where can people learn more about you, Reboot Nation, the work you're doing? Uh, so uh, YouTube, the Reboot Nation is where I put out informational, uh, sometimes just advice videos or motivational videos for anything related to porn addiction or recovery from a porn problem like porn induced sexual dysfunction. Um, I'm now on Patreon if anyone would wanna help me uh, nice. continue to put out content that can help other people and also raise awareness about the problem. That's what I'm most passionate about. And I'm on uh, Twitter and Instagram. Uh, my handle's just my name, at Gabe Deem. And um, I try to I try to be active with people that tweet at me and stuff. And I'm, I'm very active as far as 
the mainstream debate goes. So when new studies come out or new articles come out that are arguing the legitimacy of any porn related problem, then I'm pretty active on there. So good stuff. Gabe, pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much. Matt, thanks for having me, man. It's good to see you, bud.